And when you get to the outside, you can see the size goes up. Again, stiffness in the lower sections, offshore 10 to 14. Now, don't bring your small stuff down there. You need to have some backbone, borrow one, whatever you need to do. The TFO, if you need an extra rod, those, the TICR and TICRX are cannons. They're, a 10 weight is the equivalent of the tw 12 in backbone and pulling power. Had a 75 pound Dorado on a 10 weight Seven. and a 125 pound sailfish on a 10 weight. But the back, the lower section of that rod is strong enough that I could give it to any one of you and you can't bend it in your hands. It's a little heavier for casting. But when you have a fish on there, you, you love to have that power. And then when it gets windy and you're throwing 300 to 400 grains of line, you want that extra, extra power. And like I said, it gets windy down there and it's majority when we get to it is close in there. Rods no, no longer than nine feet. In the kayak, sometimes shorter. These new bass rods that some of these guys are making, Sage or whoever, if you want to spend the money, you know, are actually better for the kayak. You get a big fish on, you know, you don't want to be high sticking, have your rod pointed one way and the fish going the other way. Even a five pound fish will break your rod tip. The secret there is to throw the rod overboard, the whole thing. Grab the line as it goes past you and haul the fish into the boat with your hands. Rod doesn't go anywhere, you got the line in your hand. Right? Clean it up later. If you have a big fish that you're trying to deal with. Or have a friend. Get a friend to help you with the fish. He can knit it for you so you don't end up breaking your rod. Sure, let the drag all the way off on your reel when you've gone close to the boat. Most people tighten it down. You want to loosen it up. If he runs close in, you want to be able to drop the rod tip and not damage your rod. Reels. Reels need to be saltwater models. 150 to 400 yards of backing is the minimum 30 pound backing. Why? Because you're going to be fishing 20 pounds a lot. 20. I fished 14 the majority of the time I was down there. For the majority of my fishing, I used 14. Rarely did I go less than that, although I did fish a little late for the bone fish just for kicks. But um, there's just no reason to. The fish, they don't care. They're there to eat. They are going to eat. You show them a fly if they see it, they're going to eat it the right fly, the right size, or even more importantly, the right size as we talk about. That's a, you don't need to be able to take it apart for cleaning. If you got one of these fancy things got a million parts, that's not the really want to take down there. Because if you get sand in it and you're camping in the sand, nine times out of 10 for your best camping, you want to camp in the mangroves because the bugs are in there and it'll be on the sand where the wind blows the bugs away. You need to be able to take your reel, dip it in some water real quick, get the sand out, clean it apart and reassemble it without losing the parts. Which is another good reason, by the way, to take a shooting basket with you. Because it becomes a real good place to disassemble your reel without losing the parts. Make sure you know how to do that before you go, too. Because the first time you don't want to do it at night, in the dusk, with the wind blowing and the sand blowing, with the headlamp. It's not the time to be learning how to take apart your reel. What type of reel do you like? Well, no, I, I've broken the one about saltwater models. I have one of those old Pop 3 reels. You know what those are? The plastic cassettes that you just bop in there. That thing doesn't have anything left. The, the drag system now just is a piece of Delrin in there instead of cork. It's four screws and it's completely apart. And most of the drag is, but it's just got a little tightened down thing. No springs, no nothing. But that reel, if the plastic spools weigh nothing, I can carry seven different lines for it for the stuff in the estuaries. No problem, because I've got to control them with the palm. <coughs> that said, for the CDL, Reddington CDL reels were really good, and I, I think any reel you have is going to be good. Just make sure it's not one of the really fancy ones that you don't want to use, unless you're going offshore and going for the big fish out of the bocas. And then you want something with drag pressure, 10 to maybe 20 pounds, that it can generate. And it has to smoothly accelerate, because you're dealing with big game fish out there. Marlin and Oahu is the fastest fish in the ocean. And you're going to see some of the fish and the tangled with down there <coughs> in some of these pictures. You're going to go, holy crap. Yeah. That fish is doing 75 miles an hour, by the way. Bonefish are the second fastest fish at 55. And they'll light you up. But the CDL was my go-to reel, and then my little one when I was just chasing spotties. You know, it's just fine. And I can dip it in the salt water when I get done with it. I just go ch -ch -ch clean WD-40, put the screws back together and go. It takes five minutes to disassemble and reassemble the reel. And the only reason I took it was because of the sand. I was worried about the sand. We didn't have any problems with any of the reels that we took. At night, when the, if the, or if the wind's blowing, take some baggies or a reel cover so you can put them over that when you're in the kayak. If you're going to fish out of a kayak or a boat, the baggie keeps the salt water out of the reel most of the day until you're using it. Tighten the drags down when you rinse them so the water doesn't get in there. 
Once you get it shaken out dry, then you loosen the drags up for the night. Spare tools <coughs> with your spare lines, so you want to change them. I generally, when I'm on the kayak, always have two rods rigged up. One for light duty action, and an intermediate line perhaps, and one going for depth charging. Because you're dealing with these, these, as these estros look shallow, but they can be 30 and 40 feet deep in the little rivers and the mangroves, as we're going to see. So you're tossing 300 grain lines minimum, sometimes lead core shooting heads, because you want to get the flies in the zone, keep them there as long as possible. When it, if you're not in front of the fish and they don't see the fly, they're not eating it. You want to take your stuff to clean up. Make sure you got those things and keep them in a clean bag. Lines. Integrated 300 grain line is minimum for the operation. I carried a lot of 400 ones, but I'm fishing those heavy 10 weights and you need to bend them. The wind, mm -hmm. it's short, mostly short cast fishing in the mangroves. What now do you mean by integrated grain okay. line? Great question. Integrated, refer, we have shooting heads built into a lot of our lines now. An integrated line, the running line is fused to it. It's just seamless. There's nothing there. Or we can take a running line, which they manufacture, which is just nothing more than even monofilament, right? If you want to do that, you can take something like Suffix Elite 30 pound and you tie a knot in the end and then you take a loop to loop connection with that and the head that you're going to cast. And there's a difference to, there's a different technique to casting those. You got to get the head outside before you release it, but you can throw it like, it throws like a spinning rod. And I can throw a line 120 feet with no problem. No problem at all. That's sitting down in a kayak. Sitting down. But that's using a real slick shooter, which is a really thin, flat type of running line, and the right head to balance that rod. So I can put a T14 head on it, which is 14 grains a foot, so it's going to work out to about 375 grains. It sinks like a rock. The running line has no diameter, so it cuts through the water really quickly, too, and sinks. Best of all, you're doing mostly, you can control the wind angle, right, in a kayak. You're always fishing downwind if, you, if you're, you're playing correctly or an angle across the wind so you don't have the flies in your ears. It's kind of important. And that's true with an integrated one, too. The advantage of the integrated, which is the one-piece combination of the head fused in, so you can, you can pull it all the way. The head can come all the way into your hand. The fly can be all the way to the end of your leader at the end of your rod. With a shooting head, normally, you're not going to have it all the way in. Because right, you're going to still have that 30, 20, 25 to 30 feet of head still sitting outside there. But I, can, I bring mine at least 10 feet. The head's always in my hand before I start laying it out to go because it's just easier to pick it up off the water. But we can talk about casting later. Right. Intermediate lines, not necessary. You may find them useful. I use them in the shallower waters, especially when it, rather than a floating line, when it gets, you start to get rippling in the surface. The floating line does the same thing, it does this. You can't feel a fish take it when it's got that much slack between you and the fish. You'll never even see it. The intermediate line will run, they don't sink real fast, maybe an inch and a half, two inches a second. Well, that's pretty much a floating line. And even for fishing poppers, you can get away with that. And you'll always have a straight connection between you and the fly. Just make sure any of the running lines that are attached to them aren't floating running lines. Floating running lines are good for mending in trout streams. But not, and sometimes in currents in the surf even. But generally speaking, intermediate line is going to do you better. And of course, floating lines if you want to take one. But I would, I could safely say, I, that's one line I would probably, if I had to leave it at home, I would never even take one to Mexico. I wouldn't waste my time with a floating line. Right? Fish are on the surface. None of our, even our 300 grain lines don't sink that fast. But you can't throw it a tuna on the surface. Right? Nine inches a second. Shoot, he's, that fish is nine inches before you can get to his eyebrows. So, not a problem there. Any particular br brands you want to use are, are great. Just make sure that you clean them and make sure that you set the speed back. Leaders are not a complicated issue. Gary Graham uses six feet of 20 and 50 pound test bite tippets for his fishing. That's what he has in his book, every application. 20 to 50, 20 to 50, I'm going, wow. 50 pounds? Well, of course, he's getting pulled into the mangroves. So. Well, the kayak, you have the advantage. You're not going to get pulled in those mangroves. Only if you need the bite protection do you need to use 50 pounds or more. So most of your stuff in here, especially outside the estuary, you can go 8 to 14. That's what I use most of the time. The leader length, remember that if it, the longer it gets, the harder it is to get a fly down because it's not attached to the line. You end up with this and the fly's above your line. So. 
go as short as you dare, and then add a foot. If it's not working, make it longer. The uh, thing about the estros here, you, especially during spring tides, everybody knows what spring tide is? Full moon, new moon. You get a lot of water movement. And mangroves have all that tea and tannic in the water, so the water gets pretty stirred up. Pretty stirred up, so you don't need a long leader. In fact, you can sit on top of the fish. We were hooking up grouper where we're sitting that distance from the rod tip. Boom, right at a rod tip. They'll follow it out. So even after when you're getting ready to lift the fly, bring that rod tip slowly around because we'll have fish hammer you right at the boat, right at your feet. They don't want to lose track of that once they find it. When you go to more muscle, six to nine feet, shorten down, 20 to 25 pound. Make sure it's less than your backing strength so you don't end up losing all of your rig, all right? If you use a 50 pound leader and 30 pound test backing and the fish gets you into your backing, when he breaks it off, it's gonna break it off in your backing. And then you've lost your fly line. So just make sure whatever backing you put on there, you go offshore maybe 50 pound, then you can go up to 30. Plus the disadvantage too, it's very difficult in a kayak to break a fish off with 20 pound tippets. Very difficult to break a fish off unless he's hooked and you're hooked because he pulls the boat. Right? 30 pound is damn near impossible. And sometimes even in a regular boat, we had a Black, but black sea bass on over at Catalina. We had to wrap the line around a cleat, stern cleat, to break the fish off. Just didn't have enough leverage to do it. Offshore course, up you go. With uh, shock tippets up to 100 pound test. Those are for gill plates and teeth with the Dorado. They've got these fine teeth there. And they'll wear through your line. So the shock tippet is just, you know, if you want to go IGFA, it's 12 inches long for world records. If not, make them two feet long, who cares? whatever casts well for you. Fluorocarbon. Did I say fluorocarbon? Mm -hmm. Fluorocarbon? Yeah, two reasons. And the vanish I find particularly good, and I'm not a Berkeley rep, but I'm telling you that it's a little tougher to tie knots because you have to tighten them slowly as you tie them and make sure they're well lubricated. But that stuff is stiff and it turns a fly over and with a loop connection, as in a perfection loop or a mono slip loop, the lefty lefty craze mono slip loop to your fly, it articulates just fine, but it turns over beautifully. And the abrasion resistance is why you really want that as well. Turnover, abrasion resistance, and stealth. Three good reasons to use fluorocarbon. Right. And plus it doesn't get affected by the UV. You tie some leaders, you can take them with you next year and the next and the next. I haven't broken one that I've tied yet that I've used ten years later. Still works. So a lot of the time you just go right from your leader <coughs> right to the fly. Oh yeah. You don't use a tippet. Not well. It's just straight, straight piece of. A nine foot rod should be able to turn over a nine foot leader, no problem. Okay. Should be able to turn it over. So just straight, just straight fluorocarbon. Now, if you want a tapered leader and you don't have to, have to worry about tying these <laughs> shock tippets on, get a twenty to twenty five pound head tippet, right? A, a leader, tapered leader, it tapers down to twenty to twenty five pounds. Turn it around and you tie it on. The butt section is now the tippet section, and where the tippet would have been attaches to your fly line. Right? So it's a 20 pound test line with probably 40 or 50 pound test where the butt used to be, which is now your tippet. Right? Mm. Just turn it around. Knotless. Knotless. Pretty cool. So you can do that. If it blows your socks, it's up to you. You can do whatever you want. It's Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Fly, hook sizes. Most of the guys that go down there, big flies. Everything's got to be big. Everything's got to be big. I don't see many of the guys calling for anything less than ones. And I'll tell you what, caught tuna and needed fours because they're just, the bait's small. If the bait's small, you have to be small. Most of my fours are for spotty patterns. The surf worm was just, uh, was the number one fly down there. Stupid worm, including on halibut. Derby days. No way. Surfworm, dual surfworms accounted for probably, I'd say, 75% of all the fish I caught. I don't know why they like it. Don't know why, but they ate them. Surfworm. Pattern. It's on the Fly Flicker website. Okay. It's, it's a woolly bugger. It's tied with a root beer, a staz, right? And then it's got a hot orange tail. Nothing to it. Uh, no, I know what you're talking about. It won the one yeah, fly last super year. Super simple. Yeah. It won the one fly last year yeah. with the big Corvina. Frank yeah. was sitting there going, oh, I can't believe I got this garbage fly. I'm standing right next to it with my fly. I felt a little insulted. My buddy's standing next to it. Going, oh, you want that fly. Trust me, you want that. And he gets, 
get the big fish on the stupid thing. I, it's a little, a little mussel. It's a little, there are worm hatches all up and down our coast. There hasn't been a fish on this coast that hasn't eaten that stupid fly. Not a one, including mako sharks, by the way. What? Not a fish on this coast hasn't eaten it. Salmon, everything has eaten it. It works. Yeah. You broke, don't fix it. What about color? Well, colors, anything. Bait fish colors. The most important thing is we get through here. Here are different patterns. Let's come back to color in a second. Clousers, everybody knows how to tie one of those. Lefties, deceivers, bend backs, jiggies, Bob Pop, uh, Popovic's jiggies. It's nothing more than a heavily weighted up front fly. You can use cones. Sinkers, you can put bullet weights in front of them if you want to do that. I love those things because it enables me to tie a light fly when I want to go deeper. I just slide a bullet weight. You know what those are? Worm weights? Yeah. For bass fishing? Mm -hmm. Slide one of those on the leader up to an eighth of an ounce or more. Whatever you need. Sling it out there, get it in the bottom, and start shipping. But that's not fly fishing. <laughs> We're fishing. We're just having fun. Doesn't matter what you use. I tie one on a jig. It's actually a spoon type jig, jig head. It wobbles when it sinks. It's a clouser tied on there. It is nasty on spotted bay bass. Plus, it goes up and down. It wobbles all the way to the bottom. I'll bet it works really well on redfish, too. I can't wait. Throw that in front of them. But I got a lot of flack on the website for calling it a fly <laughs> by a guy. I said, well, I'll bet he doesn't have a single clouser in his box. Not exactly, but <laughs> not going to get political. <laughs> Among all these colors, offshore, we add some of these other patterns to these, right? The shrimp and crabs, of course, you're not going to use a whole lot offshore, although there are floating clouses. This is the key because of those tides and the murky water. Lots of flash. Remember, if you tie your flies with lots of flash, and it's too much flash, you can always just take your scissors and cut it out. Mm -hmm. You can change colors with magic markers too. All you trout guys know that, right? You never, a good guy would never go anywhere without scissors to shorten his flies or magic markers to change the colors. You can do that with the worms too. You can tie them to chartreuse and take a brown one, do the back, and you have a two tone worm. Works pretty good actually. So lots of possibilities. Keep the hook sharp. Take not a stainless one, get the rock, get the rock, whetstone. We got the little one. You can drill a hole in it in your garage and tie it around your lanyard. Never rusts. Works great in salt water. And bring plenty of ammunition. Make sure you have more flies than you need. I brought, I could have fed the whole troop with all the flies I brought. And I think I, I, don't, I don't think I used 15 flies the whole week. <laughs> I really don't think. I mean, I'd go a whole day with three flies for 200 fish. So tie them all. You are right. Tie them well, but at the same time, sometimes the more beat up it got, the harder they hit it. I took some for variety, different patterns for variety, to make sure I had enough. Because when you run out down there, there's not even a store. You can't even find a beer, a cerveza. I'm sure you can find a cerveza. Enough moolah always gets you a cerveza, and it's probably even cold there. Right, so 